Hi, and welcome to another story time with Miss Leah. It is Maundy Thursday. What a weird word, Maundy, right? And that is the day where we remember the Last su Supper officially. Okay, so tonight uh, we will have a service online that you and your family can join us for. It's at 7 o'clock, and we will be taking communion together, and we'll be remembering... Um, what Jesus did during the Last Supper. And this is his last meal with his disciples, remember. So um, things are starting to get heavy. Remember our jar that we've been talking about <sighs> all through the time of Lent and how we've been adding some stones to it. So this week we're going to add some of our stones today and then we'll add one more tomorrow and one more on Saturday, but I don't know that I'll do the video on Saturday. So I will, well, I might do, the, I don't really know. Stay tuned, I'll let you know. <laughs> but we need to add some of our stones because uh, as we get closer to Jesus's arrest and his crucifixion, um, these are the sad times. These are the times where we remember the weight, not only of our own sin, which is what, Lent is about, but we also remember the weight of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us because of his love for us. So let's go ahead and add our stones, some of the last ones, to our jar. And we've been going through this story of Holy Week. Remember on Sunday, we turned over our picture of Jesus on the donkey. We talked about Jesus' triumphal entry as he came into Jerusalem for the last time. And the people celebrated Jesus on this day. They called him Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. They wanted him to come in on a gleaming white horse and be their king. But remember, Jesus wasn't that kind of king. And the people didn't really understand who he was or what he was there to do. And Jesus continued to teach in the temple on Monday and on Tuesday and on Wednesday. But the tension was rising and the chief priests and the temple guards were trying to find a way to arrest him. They couldn't always find him. He was kind of sneaky. I like that, Jesus. And so what they had to do was they had to get one of Jesus' own disciples, Judas. And they paid Judas 30 pieces of silver and Judas and the temple guards and the priests, they came up with a plan to trap Jesus. They knew where he would be and they planned it together and Judas betrayed Jesus. And yesterday we talked about the Lord's Supper. We talked about the bread. Well, that wasn't yesterday, the day before yesterday. We talked about the bread and we talked about the cup. And how Jesus broke the bread and he shared the cup with his disciples. And he said, whenever you do this, remember me. And they were confused because he was with them. And they didn't quite understand what would have to happen. Um, and how, they would be, how their relationship with Jesus would be different. Then yesterday, this is yesterday for real. Yesterday, we talked about Peter. And we talked about... How Peter, kind of like Judas, made some mistakes because he was afraid. And when he had followed Jesus after he had been arrested, he was there listening and watching, but he didn't want anyone to know who he was. And so when people recognized him, he denied that he even knew who Jesus was so that they wouldn't know that he was one of Jesus' disciples. And then when the rooster crowed, Peter remembered what Jesus had, t had said. He had said that you will deny me three times before the rooster crows. And sure enough, Peter had done this. And so he went away and he wept. But later, we know that Peter and Jesus, um, their relationship was restored. And Peter went on to become an apostle and someone who really built the church and spread the good news about who Jesus is and what he had done for us. So it's time, it's time to turn over our next wooden disc here. So let's find out what it's about. 
Oh, let's see. We have here a bowl of water. Hmm, what could that be? We've already talked about how Jesus washed the disciples' feet, so that's not what it is. It's about someone named Pilate. Not an airplane pilot. This is spelled a little bit differently. This man named Pilate was one of the people that was in charge. He was part of the government. And when Jesus was arrested, it was up to Pilate to make the decision about what would happen to Jesus. So I'm going to read you part of what scripture says about what happened with Pilate. At dawn, the elders of the people met together. These included the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and Jesus was led to them. If you are the Messiah, they said, tell us. And Jesus answered, if I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I asked you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. And they all asked, are you the Son of God then? And he replied, you say that I am. Then they said, why do we need any more witnesses? We have heard it from his own lips. Then the whole group got up and they led Jesus to Pilate. They began to bring charges against Jesus. They said, we have found this man misleading our people. He is against paying taxes to Caesar and he claims to be a Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. Then Pilate spoke to the chief priests and the crowd. He announced, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they kept it up. They said, his teaching stirs up the people all over Judea. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. When Pilate heard this, he asked if the man was from Galilee. He learned that Jesus was from Herod's area of authority. So Pilate sent Jesus to Herod. At that time, Herod was also in Jerusalem. So Pilate, he sends Jesus to Herod because he really doesn't want to be the one that makes the decision about what's going to happen to Jesus. But when Herod gets a hold of Jesus, he doesn't find any reason to charge Jesus either. But he's kind of a mean guy, so it says that this is what Herod's, Herod does. Herod and his soldiers laughed at him and made fun of him. They dressed him in a beautiful robe. Then they sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this time, they had been enemies. So Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers of the people. He said to them, You brought me this man. You said he was turning the people against the authorities. I have questioned him in front of you, and I have found no basis for your charges against him. And Herod hasn't either. So he sent Jesus back to us. As you can see, Jesus has done nothing that is worthy of death. So I will just have him whipped and let him go. But the whole crowd shouted, Kill this man! Let Barabbas go! Barabbas had been thrown into prison. He had taken part in a struggle in the city against the authorities, and he had also committed murder. Pilate wanted to let Jesus go, so he made an appeal to the crowd again. They kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate spoke to them for the third time. Why, he asked, what wrong has this man done? I have found no reason to have him put to death, so I'll just have him whipped and let him go. But with loud shouts, they kept calling for Jesus to be crucified. The people's shouts won out, and so Pilate decided to give them what he wanted. He set free the man they asked for. The man had been thrown in prison for murder and for fighting against the authorities. Pilate handed Jesus over to them so that they could carry on their plans. The Bible also says that Pilate, one of the things he did, because he was uncomfortable with what the people were asking, it says that Pilate, when he turned Jesus over, he washed his hands. Why would he do that? He did that because he didn't want to bear the responsibility for what happened to Jesus. He knew that Jesus hadn't done anything wrong, 
He didn't know if he could stand up to the people, but he didn't want to be the one that was blamed for what happened to Jesus. Now, I don't know if Pilate could have stopped what happened to Jesus or not, but I'm not sure that him washing his hands from the guilt made much of a difference. But we do know that Pilate saw nothing wrong, but that the people still demanded that Jesus be the one that was hung on the cross, even letting someone who had committed murder go and putting Jesus in his place. So tomorrow, when we come back, tomorrow is what we call Good Friday. And Good Friday is the day that we remember that Jesus was crucified. And it's confusing that it's called Good Friday. But tomorrow, I'll talk to you a little bit more about why we call it Good Friday. So are we ready for our conclusion to our Adventures of Peter Cottontail book? I think I am. So yesterday, Peter Rabbit was trying to figure out where everyone was going for the winter. Because as a rabbit, all he has to do to prepare for winter is put on a heavy coat of fur. But all the other animals, in order to make it through the cold weather, they have to do some other things. So the bird, old Mr. Buzzard, remember he was flying away? And the frog went down to the muddy part of the pond. And the chipmunks and the squirrels were collecting nuts. And the woodchuck was fat. Remember, he had fed himself till he was so fat, and then he was going inside his house. And Peter just can't quite figure out what they're all up to. Well, this chapter is called Uncle Billy Possum Explains Things. Peter Rabbit had sat still all day long in his safe hiding place in the middle of the dear old briar patch. Jolly, round, red Mr. Sun had gone to bed behind the purple hills, and the black shadows had raced out across the green meadows and into the green forest. Now the moonlight was driving them back a little way. Peter hopped out of the old briar patch into the moonlight and stretched first one leg and then the other. Then he jumped up and down three or four times to get the kinks out of his long hind legs. Finally, he started off up the lone little path, lipperty, lipperty, lip. Halfway up the lone little path, Peter almost ran headlong into Uncle Billy Possum. My goodness, Br'er Rabbit, you'll done give me a powerful start, exclaimed Uncle Billy. Why, you all in such a right smart hurry fool. Peter Rabbit grinned as he stopped trying. I didn't mean to frighten you, Uncle Billy. The fact is, I was on my way up to your house to see how you and old Mrs. Possum and all the children do this fine fall weather, said Peter Rabbit. Uncle Billy Possum looked at Peter Rabbit sharply. Seems to me you all had taken a powerful sudden interest in we alls. All done remembering seeing you up our way for a long time, Br'er Rabbit, said he. Peter looked a little foolish, for it was true that he hadn't been near Uncle Billy's hollow tree for a long, long time. You see, I've been very busy getting ready for winter, said Peter, by way of an excuse. Uncle Billy began to chuckle and then to laugh. He rested both hands on his knees and laughed and laughed. Peter Rabbit couldn't see anything to laugh at, and he began to get a wee bit provoked. What's the joke? he demanded. The very idea of Br'er Rabbit getting ready for winter, or of being busy about anything but other people's affairs, cried Uncle Billy, wiping his eyes. Peter tried to feel and to look very angry, but he couldn't. No, sir, he couldn't. The very twinkle in Uncle Billy Possum's eyes made Peter want to laugh, too. In fact, Peter just had to laugh. Finally, both stopped laughing, and Peter told Uncle Billy all about the things that had troubled him. Johnny Chuck disappeared down in his house and said he would see me in the spring. What did he mean just by that? asked Peter. Just what he said, replied Uncle Billy. He done gone down to his bed and gone to sleep. And he is going to stay asleep till next spring. Peter's eyes looked as if they would pop right out of his head. And Grandfather Frog, what has become of him? He asked. Oh, Grandfather Frog, he done go to sleep too. Down in the mud at the bottom of the smiling pool. I reckon you see Grandfather Frog come up right pert in spring, 
said Uncle Billy. An old Mr. Buzzer, he shouted down from the blue, blue sky, that he would see me in the spring. Has he gone to sleep up there? asked Peter. Uncle Billy Possum threw back his head and laughed fit to kill himself. Bless your long ears, no, Br'er Rabbit. No, indeed, oh my, no. Br'er Buzzard done fly way down south to old Virginia to stay through the cold winter. And I most wish I was right along with him, added Uncle Billy, suddenly growing sober. Then Peter Rabbit had a sudden thought. You aren't going away to sleep all winter, are you, Uncle Billy? He asked anxiously. The grin came back to Uncle Billy's face. No, Br'er Rabbit, I reckons y'all can find me right in my hollow tree most any time this winter if you knock loud enough. But I do reckon I'm going out much. I do reckon I'm going to have a right smart lot of sleep, replied Uncle Billy. Peter Rabbit has a bright idea. Peter Rabbit had a bright idea. At least Peter thought it was. And it, he chuckled over it a great deal. The more he thought about it, the better it seemed. What was it? Why, to follow the plan of Johnny Chuck and Grandfather Frog to avoid the cold stormy weather by sleeping all winter. Yes, sir. That was what Peter Rabbit's bright idea was. If Johnny Chuck can sleep and sleep the whole long stormy winter through, it ought to be, it seems to me, the very best thing to do. Peter Rabbit said this to himself as he sat in the middle of the old briar patch, chewing the end of straw. If Johnny Chuck could do it, of course he could do it. All he would have to do would be to find a snug, warm house which nobody else was using, fix himself a comfortable bed, curl up, and go to sleep. Peter tried to picture himself sleeping away while the snow lay deep all over green meadows, and the smiling pool could smile no more because the ice, the hard black ice, would not let it. Finally, Peter could sit still no longer. He just had to tell someone about his bright idea. And, and well, he wasn't quite sure of just the way to go to sleep and sleep so long, for never in his life had Peter Rabbit slept more than a very, very short time without waking to see that no danger was near. I'll just run up and see Uncle Billy Possum, said Peter. Uncle Billy Possum was sitting in his doorway in his big hollow tree in the green forest when Peter Rabbit came hurrying up, lipperty lipperty lip. Peter hardly waited to say good morning before he began to tell Uncle Billy all about his bright idea. Uncle Billy listened gravely, though there was a twinkle in his eyes. The first thing you must do is find a warm place to sleep, Br'er Rabbit, said Uncle Billy. Oh, that's easy enough, said Peter. And then you must get fat, Br'er Rabbit, continued Uncle Billy. What's that? exclaimed Peter, looking very much puzzled. I say you must get fat, repeated Uncle Billy, slapping his own fat sides. What for? asked Peter. To keep you warm while you sleep, replied Uncle Billy. Must I get very fat? Peter asked. Yes, sir, you must get very fat indeed, said Uncle Billy, and he smiled, for it was hard to think of Peter Rabbit as very fat. How, how do I get very fat? asked Peter, and he looked a little bit worried. By eating and eating and eating and between times sitting still, replied Uncle Billy Possum. Well, that's easy. At least the eating is, said Peter who, you know, thinks a great deal of his stomach. Is that all, Uncle Billy? That's about all, excepting you must have it. Mustn't have anything on your mind when you goes try to sleep, Br'er Rabbit. You mustn't get to worrying for fear Br'er Fox going to find you while you're asleep, said Uncle Billy, and grinned when Peter happened to turn his head. Peter thanked Uncle Billy, and he hurried back to the old briar patch to think over all that Uncle Billy had told him. I certainly will try it, said Peter. Peter prepares for a long sleep. Day after day, Peter Rabbit ran about his way and that over the green meadows and through the green forest as if he had something on his mind. Jimmy Skunk noticed it, and so did Billy Mink and Bobby Coon. 
But Peter wouldn't stop to explain. Indeed, he was always in such a hurry that he wouldn't stop at all. But when he met them, he would shout, Hello! over his shoulder and keep right on running. Liberty, liberty, lip. Uncle Possum was the only one who guessed what it meant. Uncle Billy grinned as he watched Peter running about with such serious and important air. Rare Rabbit's trying dreadful hard to fool himself. I reckon he's looking for a place to curl up and try to sleep all winter, said Uncle Billy. Uncle Billy had guessed just right. Peter was looking for a place to curl up to sleep all winter. Peter was too lazy to dig a new house for himself. Then it was too late in the fall anyway. He would just find some old deserted house that some of Jimmy Skunk's relatives or Johnny Chuck's rel relations had given up using. So Peter went poking into every old house he knew of, trying to find one that wasn't so tumble down that it wouldn't do. At last he found one that he thought would be just the place. And Peter chuckled to himself as he planned how he would curl up in the bedchamber way down at the end of the long hall. Nobody will ever guess where I am, he said to himself, and he laughed aloud. Then Peter remembered that Uncle Billy Possum had told him that it was necessary to eat a great deal so to be very, very fat before going to sleep, for that was the way to keep warm all winter. So Peter started out to grow fat. This would be fun, the very best kind of fun, for there is nothing Peter Rabbit loves more than to fill his stomach, unless it is to satisfy his curiosity. Peter Rabbit's stomach is a thing most amazing. It takes so long to fill it up. His time is short for lazy. Perhaps this is the reason why, when Peter isn't eating, he wants to loaf around and watch other people work. Anyway, Peter is a tremendous eater, and now that he wanted to grow fat, he felt that he must eat more than ever. So he began at once to eat and to eat and to eat. But there was one very important thing that Peter had forgotten. He had quite forgotten that it was now late in the fall, and the tender young green things, which Peter dearly loves to eat, were gone. He could no longer go down to the sweet clover patch and fill himself up to bursting. Farmer Brown had taken away all the cabbages and carrots and turnips that had made his garden so attractive to Peter. So now, Peter had to hunt for what he had to eat. That made a great deal of running about, and it is very hard work to grow fat when one runs about. The more Peter ate, the more he had to hunt for his food. And the more he had to hunt for his food, the more he had to run about. And the more he had to run about, the more he hurried, and the faster he ran. Now, of course, running takes off the fat. Oh, dear, cried Peter Rabbit. Getting fat is not as easy as I thought. Uncle Billy Possum plays a joke. Some folks never seem to be satisfied or quite content, always wanting something more that for them was never meant. Uncle Billy Possum said this to himself as he watched Peter Rabbit hurrying about through the green forest and over the green meadows, eating as fast as he ever could, so as to grow fat that he might keep warm while he slept all winter. Now, Uncle Billy Possum knew perfectly well that Peter Rabbit couldn't sleep all winter as Johnny Chuck does, for Old Mother Nature had never planned that Peter should. But Uncle Billy knew that it was of no use to tell Peter that, for Peter would not believe him. So he chuckled as he watched Peter rush about, hunting for food and actually running off what little fat he did have, instead of putting on more. Of course, it just happened that Uncle Billy Possum was right over near the old house built by Grandfather Skunk a long time ago, which Peter Rabbit had decided to sleep in all winter. It just happened that he saw Peter when he finally went down to the little bedchamber at the end of the long hall to curl up and try to go to sleep. Uncle Billy grinned. Then he chuckled. Finally, he laughed until his side shook. I reckon I'm going to have some fun with Br'er Rabbit, said Uncle Billy, still chuckling, as he trotted off through the green forest. He went over to Bobby Coon's house and found Bobby, who had been out all night, just getting ready for bed. But Bobby is always ready to play a joke. 
And when Uncle Billy told him about Peter Rabbit and what fun it would be to give Peter a scare, Bobby scrambled down from his hollow tree right away. Then he hunted up Jimmy Skunk, and the three started for the old house of Grandfather Skunk, where Peter Rabbit was trying to go to sleep for the winter. I done tell Peter that when he tried to go to sleep, he mustn't get to thinking about what would happen if Br'er Fox should just happen along and help find him asleep. I reckons that that's the very first thing that Peter did think of as soon as he curled himself up, and that he's thinking of it more than ever right this blessed minute. Y'all's wait while I was listening at the door. Uncle Billy stole very softly to the door of the old house. Then he began to grin and beckon to Bobby Coon and Jimmy Skunk to come listen. They could hear long sighs from way down the bedchamber at the end of the long hall. They heard Peter twist and turn as he tried to make himself comfortable. But when they heard him saying a verse over and over to try to make himself go to sleep, they had to clap their hands right over their mouths to keep from laughing out loud. When they grew tired of listening, Uncle Billy whispered to Jimmy Skunk, and Jimmy Skunk grinned, and then he crept a little way down the long hall and began to scratch with his snout and his claws as if he were digging. When he stopped, Uncle Billy put his mouth down close to the doorway and barked as nearly like Reddy Fox as he could. Then Jimmy began to dig again, and pretty soon Uncle Billy barked again, and then all three stole softly away and hid behind some bushes. I reckon Br'er Rabbit's right smart wide awake instead of going to sleep for the winter, chuckled Uncle Billy. Peter Rabbit learns his lesson. Peter Rabbit curled up in the little bedchamber at the end of the long hall in the old house made a long time ago by Grandfather Skunk, twisted and turned and tried to make himself feel sleepy. But the harder he tried, the more wide awake he seemed to feel. Then he began to think of Reddy and Granny Fox, and what would happen if by chance they should find him there, fast asleep. And right where he was thinking about it, he heard a noise that made him jump so that he bumped his head. Peter didn't think anything about the bump on his head. No, sir, Peter didn't even notice it. He was too frightened. He held his breath, and he listened while his heart went pit-a-pat, pit-a-pat. There it was again, that noise he'd heard before. Someone was in the long, dark hall. There was no doubt about it. He could hear the claws scratching. Whoever it was was digging, digging. The very thought made every hair on Peter's, Peter Rabbit stand on end. He knew that Johnny Chuck had gone to sleep for the winter, he knew that Jimmy Skunk could walk right in without any trouble and that Jimmy never takes any trouble that he can avoid. He knew that Bobby Coon and Uncle Billy Possum don't go into houses underground unless they have to to get away from danger, and they do that very seldom. If someone was digging in the long dark hall, it could mean but one thing, that it must be someone too big to get in without making the hall larger. And the only ones he could think of were Bowser the Hound and Reddy and Granny Fox. Peter shivered and he shook, for unlike Johnny Chuck's house, this one had no back door. If it's Bowser the Hound, he may get tired and go away. Anyway, I can soon tell, for he will sniff and snuff and blow the sand out of his nose, thought Peter. He strained his ears to hear the first sniff. But there were no sniffs or snuffs. Instead, Peter heard a sound that made his heart almost stop beating again. It was a bark. A bark that sounded very much like the bark of Reddy Fox. And it came from just outside the door. That could mean but one thing, that old Granny Fox was digging her way into the little bedchamber with Reddy kept, while Reddy kept watch outside. Oh dear, oh dear, why wasn't I content to live as I always have lived? Whatever did I try to do something I never was intended to do for, cried Peter to himself, and he shook with fright harder than ever. There was nothing to do but to sit still and wait. So Peter 
sat as still as ever he could. In a little while, the noise in the long, dark hall stopped. Peter waited. And he waited. But all was still. And he began to feel a little better. Perhaps old Granny Fox didn't know that he was there at all, and had grown tired of digging, and had gone away. So Peter waited a long time, and then he peeped out into the long hall. Way up at the end, he could see light where the doorway was, and by this he knew that no one was in the hall. Little by little, his heart going pit-a-pat, Peter crept up until he could peep outside. No one was to be seen. With his heart almost in his mouth, Peter sprang out and started for the dear old briar patch as fast as his long legs could take him. And then he heard a sound that made him stop suddenly and sit up. Ah, ha, ha. Oh, ha, ha, he, 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 there behind some bushes, Uncle Billy Possum, Bobby Coon, and Jimmy Skunk were laughing fit to kill themselves. Then Peter knew what they, that they had played a joke on him, and he shook his fist at him. But down in his heart, he was glad, for he knew that he had learned his lesson that he had no business to try to do what old Mother Nature had never intended that he should do. Of course, these are not all of Peter Rabbit's adventures. Oh my, no. But there are so many other little people who live in the green meadows and in the green forest who have adventures too and get into funny scrapes. And I am sure you will be willing to say good night to Peter for a little while and hear about the things that have happened to some of the others. And so in the next book, I am going to tell you about the worries and troubles and exciting escapes of one of Peter's friends, Uncle Billy Possum. The end. Well, I hope you enjoyed my story about the adventures of Peter Cottontail by Thornton Bur Burgess. I think Burgess. Burgess. We're not really sure. Um. And you guys can come back tomorrow and we'll have another story time and we'll talk about Good Friday and then uh, we will get closer and closer and closer to Easter, which I like to call Resurrection Sunday. You guys have a good day. Get outside. It's beautiful out there, even if it's a little colder than it was yesterday. Bye. Love you all. See ya.